Francis Decoy is playing the part of a 14-year-old named Cindy. She's talking to this man, Marvin Lackhand, screen name Crazy Trini 85. They met in an online chat room. Cindy tells him she's a The 2004 iteration of Chris Hansen and Dateline NBC's To Catch a Predator managed to pull in some strange faces from all over America. Everyone from doctors, teachers, men of the law, and even rabbis would pull up to Perverted Justice's dinky little sting house, hoping to peruse with a 12 to 14 year old boy or girl. You know that if they walk into Chris Hansen's wacky house of fun, they have some dirty things on their minds, on their conscious, and in their chat logs. From the way they talk, dress, or act, these dudes simply emanate the energy that your parents told you to avoid in high school. From Lorne Armstrong to Anthony Palumbo and that fucking weird Scooby-Doo guy who was fat, all these men have in one way or another become immortalized within the To Catch a Predator community due to the strange ways they handled their appearances on the show. From Lorne Armstrong looking like a fresh stroke victim every time he tries to speak, to Anthony Palumbo's devious trip to Atlantic City, and fucking fat boy over here thinking that a Monopoly get out of jail free card is a real thing. The 2004 To Catch a Predator was a gold mine when it came to finding hundreds of dudes that the entire viewer base could just rip on without feeling bad about it. Because most of the dudes were most definitely pedophiles. The 2016 iteration though, was on a whole new level. The dudes that pulled up to the sting houses in 2016 were some of the strangest, dumbest, and most memeable guys we'd ever seen. While the 2004 TCAP community was probably memeing guys like Anthony Palumbo pretty hard on their forums, in 2016, this was a whole new kettle of fish. Hanson vs Predator, the 2016 reiteration of To Catch a Predator, as a show was mostly being distributed on YouTube, so it's almost impossible for the community not to jump on these guys and meme every possible aspect. And don't forget, this was the gracious year of 2016, where edgy jokes reigned supreme. This was the year that Leafy is here really hit his stride. Any nutcase on YouTube who was willing to eat their friend's vomit while shouting racial slurs could reach unprecedented numbers. 9-11 was funny to millions of people because of memes, and hundreds of thousands of people were simultaneously telling Anita Sarkeesian and Zoe Quinn to FUCK RIGHT OFF! Well, it's not exactly what we needed, but I think the internet was in love with the idea of memeing these dudes straight to the depths of hell and destroying their reputation for years to come. Even if you aren't the biggest fan of TCAP or Hanson vs Predator, you've probably seen this dude's face around the web at least once. And I can't really blame anyone for jumping to the honeypot when there's so much meme content here. I mean, come on. We've got Steelers and the I mean, Ravens guy. We just hit it off, friends. You hit it off with a 13 year old girl. Just, we were just talking. Just talking. Well, now you're here. This is more than talk. I know, but you just came in to hang out. Now and I brought, what, get a hug? And watch football. Watch football? Yep. Who's playing tonight? Steelers and the Ravens. I had no attention with nothing. Fat gay man. Nothing actually, just to hang out. Just to hang out. Yeah. With a 13 year old boy who you sent a picture of your private parts. No, I did it. I did? Yes. Ooh. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to do that. Ooh, it was right. Yeah. I was You've just been chatting with him on and off for weeks. Okay. Yeah, I used to chat with random people on and off. I'd hang out with them. No, nothing's really sexual, to be honest. Nothing sexual? No. What's this, sir? Let me see. Oh my god, I did not know I even sent that. Ooh. Yeah, I did not know that. Who was right? Yeah, usually when I send a picture, like I have a bunch of pictures of me. Right. So I must have hit that, but I didn't even know why. So this was just one big mistake? Yeah, I, pretty much, yeah. So you had a picture of yourself out and about town? Because you just, like, you just me a car. Yeah, like you just the penis pic. Oh, oh, by mistake, I hit the penis pic. Yeah. Chinese takeout for one, and finally. The Undertaker!
but in my personal opinion, one man stands head and shoulders above the rest when it comes to meme value. The poster boy of Planet Pizza. The man with the tiny dick. The man who can't seem to find a plumber who wants to fix his leaking pipes anywhere. This is the story of one man, Jeffrey Sokol. What you see being edited behind me, you can see nowhere else. It is more compelling and disturbing than virtually anything you can watch on TV today. It is my complete interview with Jeff Sokol. Who's this? I'll get to that in a minute. Who are you? Who are you? I will get to that in a minute. Huh? Go ahead, have a bite. Wow. You say, I can't go to jail. My life would be ruined. Right. Could be locked up for 20 years. Yep. It's Explain fine. it to me. Just wanted to come hang out. It looks like here you wanted to come here and have sex with a 13-year-old girl. Okay. Is there? Is that against the law to like... To they have sex with a 13-year-old girl no. when you're 44? Yes, no, it's against the law. To... Jeffrey B. Sokol was born on June 4th of 1971 in Boston, Massachusetts. During the production of the episode he appeared on, Jeff was 44 years old. And while not much is known about his life prior to the appearance, we can deduce a few things about him and his occupations before his arrest. During a Reddit AMA, one of Sokol's former friends would come forward to talk about Jeff's life before the sting. Jeff's friend claimed that he was a mostly normal person whose education life was filled with parties, drinking, and smoking weed. Outside of his strange dress sense and his inability to keep within a long-lasting relationship, he was a mostly normal guy with normal interests. Jeff formerly worked as an auditor for an insurance company, where he would work for many years. Whilst it's not necessarily confirmed that he would earn this amount of money, the average salary for an auditor is $75,222 per year in specifically Boston, Massachusetts. Despite a decent yearly salary, there was supposedly a period in time where Jeff had experienced some relationship turmoil due to said profession, where his at the time partner was annoyed that he wouldn't strive to get a higher paying job and was simply contempt for working at an insurance firm. In terms of interests, we can deduce that Jeff was an avid baseball fan, and this thought is corroborated by the Reddit AMA, where Jeff's former friend claims that he was obsessed with sports, and specifically fantasy football. It's also clear that Jeff was a fan of heavy metal and hard rock, as his profile on LinkedIn was named Master of Puppets, named after and directly referencing the popular album by metal band Metallica. Jeff's chat logs are extensive and plentiful spanning multiple pages of chat between Jeff and the decoy who was playing the role of a 13-year-old girl named Bailey. The chat started on Wire Club, where it's theorized that Jeff initiated the conversation with the decoy. Then they move to Skype, where the rest of the chat takes place. Jeff plays the role of a nice guy looking to be friends at first, only rarely choosing to talk about relationships or sex. It's only later on that Jeff decides to start raising the topic more often, asking questions about the decoy's personal hygiene, how much they've done with boys, and after a while, talking about getting intimate with her himself. While the chats seem pretty normal for a man being let on by a decoy this far, Jeff would soon take a more frightening turn with his proposal he would bring up a little later. One of the things that became quickly apparent during the reading of the chats is that Jeff is suspicious of the decoy's legitimacy almost constantly, asking her to prove her identity by taking photos or getting on webcam for short video calls. 
This, however, is nothing compared to Jeff's marriage contract proposal. During the chat logs, after Jeff's worries about candidness were abolished, Jeff would begin talking about sex with the decoy and made many statements laying out his worries around going through with the act, making claims like, my life would be ruined, reinstating the fact that Jeff was completely aware of the crime he was committing and its severity. However, Jeff would also go on to state, the only way it would be legal for me and you to have sex is if we were married. Jeff would propose a marriage contract between him and the decoy, which would in effect allow him to have relations with her free of legal ramifications. Now I don't think I need to state this, but a contract of this kind most likely doesn't exist in the Western world. But in all fairness to Jeff, I did some research. When searching up marriage contract, all I found on Google was info about a Korean show on Netflix. And if the story has anything to do with a marriage contract being used in the same context as the one Sokol proposed, then, uh, maybe I should, uh, check it out. <laughs> <coughs> when looking into legit marriage contracts that allow legal adults to marry young children, all I got was child anti-marriage organizations telling me why it was wrong and shouldn't exist. And I'll be honest, I felt like I was put on some kind of list or something. As far as I can see, this was most likely Jeff trying to manipulate the decoy into thinking that if a contract legally existed for things like this, then what he was planning was normal and not weird. Sokol came with food and an appetite for sex. He left after a very aggressive interview with me in handcuffs. On the day of the sting, Jeff drove three hours from his home in Boston to the sting house in Fairfield, Connecticut, where the episode took place and the other predators were also being apprehended. In the episode, Jeff arrives in the dead of night, despite the fact that he actually intended to arrive during the late afternoon. There are a few reasons for his late arrival. It seemed that the universe wanted to keep Jeff from making the trip to Connecticut, because on the day that he intended to go and meet the decoy, a pipe in his apartment burst. After this, Jeff had to spend multiple hours finding a plumber that would be able to come and fix the pipe itself. However, the plumber was late to arrive by many hours, and the job itself took a while. During this time, Jeff would call the decoy and fill her in on what's going on. Finally, after the pipe was fixed, Jeff would set off on his three-hour drive, only stopping once on the way to pick up a pepperoni pizza from Planet Pizza. He would comment on the pizza itself during the sting, stating that he thought ordering a small pizza wouldn't be enough, but that the small pizza was almost as big as the large. Um, the, um, the small pizza is like almost as big as the uh, big one. So I, I didn't know that. Like you said small, I thought it would be like a really small one. Yeah. Sorry. You okay? Interestingly, it was Chris Hansen's son Chase who convinced the decoy to tell Jeff to buy the pizza from Planet Pizza. Upon arriving at the sting house, the nervous decoy would let Sokol in, and the two of them would engage in some awkward conversation for a while, as both of them talked yeah. about how it was their first time meeting someone yeah, of this age this online. Jeff would at one point go in for a hug, only for the decoy to recoil leaving Jeff to awkwardly shrug off the rejection. At one point, the decoy states how crazy the concept of Jeff driving three hours to meet her was. Jeff, seemingly taken off guard by this comment, agrees, stating, I mean, I've met girls online, but I, I don't, like, 
come like this far to like meet someone. I don't know why I, you know. It's kind of crazy, huh? It is crazy, yeah. Why did you let me come? If you're so nervous. Jeff then asks the decoy why she thinks he came all the way to meet her. She responds nervously. Why do you think I came? The decoy brings up the contract proposal, which Jeff shrugs off, most likely regretting the idea in the first place. The two of them continue chatting awkwardly before Jeff sits down to eat some pizza. During this time, Jeff takes a pill at the table. While people were quick to think this pill was some kind of sexual enhancement drug, it was later confirmed to be a drug for Jeff's IBS which Jeff has been diagnosed with. After a few more moments of silence, inexplicably from another room in the house, a door closes, alerting both Jeff and the decoy. The decoy offers to go and investigate, while Jeff nervously sits, questioning if someone else is present. Chris Hansen walks into the kitchen, where Sokol is sitting, and asks him what kind of pizza he's eating. I'll get to that in a minute. Who are you? Who are you? You tell me first. You're Jeff, right? Yeah. And what are you doing here tonight, Jeff? Hanging out. Hanging out with whom? With her. Who's her? I, I, I want to know who you are. I want to know a little bit more about you first. Can I eat first? Sure, go ahead. Jeff then asks if he can eat a slice of pizza before telling Chris his name. Jeff maintains his innocence and responds to Chris's questions with an arrogant tone. When Chris brings up the marriage contract, Jeff laughs off the question before taking another bite of pizza. Did you bring some kind of a contract with you? Some sort of marriage contract? <laughs> Let's see if any of this sounds familiar while you enjoy your pizza. I should come see you. Jeff yet again laughs when Hanson brings up a question that Jeff posed to the decoy, in which he asked her if her pubic hair is shaven. You say, I can't go to jail. Jeff attempts to claim that he doesn't know the age of the decoy, despite acknowledging this fact multiple times within the chat log. Okay. Now you know that this girl is 13, right? Wasn't sure. She's told you. No. That doesn't... And you're what? 37? That doesn't mean anything. You're 37? How old are you? You might as well just tell me because I can find out like that. Who are you? Can you tell me who you are first? I will tell you that in a minute. Because, you know, now you're, you're... After Chris reads out more of the chat logs, Jeff seems to lower his guard and begin to be more receptive to Chris's questioning seemingly realizing that his arrogant tone isn't working out in the situation, without completely dropping his arrogance, however. Chris asks Jeff to explain what he was expecting to happen during his visit. After a little bit of thinking, Jeff states that he simply wanted to hang out with the decoy. Chris rebuts this by stating that there was clear sexual intentions on the part of Jeff. In a move so stupid that even surprises Chris Hansen, Jeff asks Chris if it's illegal to have sex with a 13-year-old girl. Or at least that's what it appears as he asks. He actually asks if meeting a girl is illegal, which Sokol states was the only thing he'd done up until that point, despite the fact that Chris had provided many pieces of evidence pointing to the fact that he had also tried to solicit sex with a minor over the internet. Sex with a 13 year old girl. Okay, is, there, is that against the law to like... To they have sex with a 13 year old girl no. when you're 44? Yes, no, it's against meet, the law. To meet, to meet a girl, that's all I've done. You see how this looks. Okay, but, but, but do you also see that I was pretty apprehensive about the whole sex thing? Well, wouldn't you be? Wouldn't anybody be if they're right. going to try to have sex with a 13-year-old girl? Uh, what, uh, to be honest with you, yeah. you're not going to believe me, but... Jeff asks Chris if he seems like a dishonest, dirty person. Chris responds by bringing up the chat yet again, which causes Chris to let out an exasperated sigh. Jeff states that chat is just chat, 
but Chris makes the point of Jeff showing up at the house in person, automatically nullifying that argument. So that, I mean, do I seem like a like a like a dishonest, dirty person? I mean, do I do I seem like it to you? This chat seems like it. It seems like chat someone who is forty four years old. Chat is chat. Chat is chat, but showing up is showing up. And guess what, Jeff? You showed up at a home where you knew a thirteen year old girl would be alone after a sexually charged conversation online. Chris finally reveals his identity to Jeff, and then the camera crew reveals themselves from other rooms. Jeff is visibly nervous. After stating that he didn't want to continue the interview while the cameras were rolling, Jeff hesitates for a few more minutes. Hanson urges Jeff to leave, even allowing him to take his pizza with him if it meant he would leave quicker. Jeff waits for a few seconds before asking Hanson if he would like a slice of pizza. Hanson politely declines, and then Jeff goes on to offer the rest of the camera clue a slice as well. He then gets up and wanders out the back, where the Fairfield County Police apprehend him and take him into custody. What do you do for a living, Jeff? I don't want to talk anymore there's insurance business right cameras rolling insurance I don't want to talk anymore all right as I said you're free to leave can you shut it off I cannot shut it off no. I mean what is this it's an investigation for a television program called Hanson versus Predator where we investigate grown people who go online and try to create inappropriate illegal relationships with underage children. So unless you have something else to say, now would be a good time to go. Jeff was apprehended during the Fairfield, Connecticut sting, and during his legal battles after his featured episode, it was proven many times that Jeff's attitude when being interviewed by Chris was not an isolated case. During the interrogation held by the Fairfield County Police Department, he was arrogant and failed to accept blame for his actions. During his legal case, Sokol would burn through three different defense lawyers before finally settling with one to sit trial with. The defense lawyer in question made the argument that Jeff suffers from OCD and anxiety-based mental health issues, that while not completely debilitating, were enough to affect his personality, which justifies in their eyes why he was acting so arrogant on the show and for a good time afterwards. A test was also performed on Sokol to attempt to gauge if Sokol was attracted sexually to minors. The test saw many pulse sensors attached to Sokol's genitalia. He was then shown pictures of children to see if he became stimulated by the pictures, Apparently, Sokol passed with flying colours. Interestingly to note, during the chat logs, Sokol decided it was important to mention that his genitals were smaller than average, and it has kind of become a defining personality trait for him within the To Catch a Predator community. Interestingly enough, another individual who was also caught in the Fairfield, Connecticut sting, known as Michael Manzi, would make comments ragging on Sokol for being so arrogant during and after the sting, and even during trial, which serves to show that Sokol wasn't acting out of the ordinary during the show. Jeff would, in end, receive seven years for his crime, but would only have to serve 30 months minimum before his release. He would also have to register as a sex offender for 10 years after the fact. At the end of the day, what makes Jeff Sokol so interesting? With so many predators being caught by Chris Hansen and his team for over a decade, why is this guy the most interesting out of all of them? He doesn't talk funny like Anthony Palumbo. He hasn't become a lolcow like Lorne Armstrong. 
He didn't come into the house naked like crazy Trini. He was just Jeff Sokol, the everyday man, and I think that's really what interests me about him. He seems so normal on the outside, but when Chris Hansen backed him up into that corner, had his back against the wall, and made him feel vulnerable, he became one of the most punchable motherfuckers on the planet. Jeff perfectly displayed how not to act in a situation like this. He was arrogant, annoying, stupid, narcissistic, manipulative, and worst of all, he has a small cock. But ladies and gentlemen, if I learned anything from making this video, it'd be this. If you go to Planet Pizza, the small pepperoni is just as large as the big one. Thanks for watching. It's 11.37. I have to go to bed. I'll see you next time.